Our next speakers are Roy, Roy Uziel and uh, Meital. Uh, they are from Ben Gurion University and they work with Oren Freifeld. Uh, their work was presented in ICCV 2019, so if you haven't made it to Korea, this is your chance to learn about their work. Thank you, Tani. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roy, and this is Meitar, and today we are going to present our ICCV paper, Bayesian Adaptive Superpixel Segmentation. So, first of all, what are superpixels? Superpixels are the result of oversegmenting an image. They divide the image into much more meaningful region. As you can see in this image, we mark the boundary of each superpixel in order to distinguish between them. We are expecting from each superpixel to be well aligned across boundary, to be homogeneous in the color space, and to be compact as possible. By compact, we mean we want it to have regular boundaries and a simple shape. Superpixels have recent applications, such as optical flow estimation, object detection, and semantic segmentation. Fay et al. used the superpixel as an input to graphical neural network. Each superpixel is a node in a graph, and we have edge between neighboring superpixels. They managed to get comparable results using this reduced input. Another application is explainable AI. They use superpixel in order to segment the image and define which segment explains the class with the highest probability. In order to get familiar with other methods in the limitation, let's introduce to you the maybe most widely used method, slick. Slick is actually k-means over the location and color space. They use post-processing heuristic in order to fix topological constraints. Alongside the original image and the boundaries, we can see the mean colors. The mean colors is a good indication for the quality of the segmentation, when sometimes looking at the boundary is a bit difficult to judge. Here you can see the wooden sticks and the peak of the bird is completely missing. Another common trade-off is between compactness and alignment across, across edges. On the left, we can see a nicely looking super pixel but that are not well aligned across edges in comparison to the right when we have a lot of irregular boundaries. Maybe the biggest limitation of other method is the adaptiveness, or actually the limited adaptiveness. Please look at the air of the woman and at the background. We have a lot of superpixel there at a completely homogeneous area, and actually not enough superpixel on informative regions. We can see it more clearly when looking at the mean image. Please look at the nostrils or the pupils. We can hardly figure out that we are looking at the same woman. Some other method try to extend the k-means algorithm and to use GMM. In GMM, we are also estimating the covariances. Let's define k as the number of superpixels. This time, this time, we have n data points, one for each pixel. Each data point contains both the location and the color. Please note that in GMM, we have k number of superpixels is predefined by the user. And actually, it's a bit problematic when we are using it as a pre-process algorithm. In order to overcome this, we decided to take it one step further and to use DPGMM. In DPGMM, we have infinite amount of Gaussians. And k, the number of cluster, is finite but it's the random variable. So our proposed model, BAS, is actually a variant of DPGMM, which respects connectivity. This time, the labels, given the parameters, are no longer IID. Our generative model assigns each pixel to one Gaussian, and we are estimating the mean and covariances of both the location and the uh, color. For the full mathematical construction, you can see our paper. Our optimization-based inference is divided into two main steps. First, for a fixed k, we are estimating the Gaussian parameters. And then, we are doing label updates while doing uh, topologically aware. From time to time, we are changing k via split and mergers. In order to overcome the connectivity problem, we use Jason Chang idea. 
Chang in his paper used a simple point concept in order to do the label updates. It's enough to look at the region of three by three in order to figure out if we can change the label without breaking connectivity. By breaking connectivity, I mean we want each superpixel to, don't, to not have holes. Jason's his paper did it sequentially. We figure out we can do it in parallel over a quarter of the pixels simultaneously. On the right, each square corresponds to pixel. And squares with the same color are updated in the same time. In order to overcome the trade-off between the compactness and the alignment across edges, we did two things. The first is putting a prior, normal in the Swiss art, over the spatial covariances. And to gain even further robustness, you, we used an MRF term. Here you can see the result of using the MRF. On the left, we have weird edges, but on the right, we have nicely looking boundaries. Let's go back to the biggest problem of other methods, is the segmenting uninformative regions. We have two main problems here. First, over-segmenting the sky, which is completely homogeneous. And the second is that we are missing the parachute and the parachuter. We manage, with our data-preserving segmentation, to both capture the parachute and the parachuter without wasting superpixel, and to have a large superpixel at the sky area. So, as Ray said, we have adaptiveness in the number of superpixels in our method. We do this by proposing in each iteration either splitting a superpixel into two or merging two superpixels into one. We do this by using the Hastings ratio, which is known for its good mathematical properties. So, for a split proposal, we check whether the two new suggested splitted superpixel explain the data better than the original one. Similarly, we accept a merge proposal if the new merged superpixel explain the data better than the two original ones. Note that in the two Hastings ratio terms, we have the gamma function, which is a normalization constant, and the alpha, which is an hyperparameter of the DPGMM, which encourages splits. In each iteration, we consider splitting or merging all the superpixel in the image. So if we accept a split or merge proposal, we need to make sure that we do it in a connectivity-preserving manner. So for merges, we restrict ourselves to merging only pairs of superpixels. However, in splits, it's more complex because the superpixel might have non-convex shape. We solve this by using an elegant algorithm with BFS in order to split a superpixel in a connectivity-preserving manner. <clears throat> so, for example, look at the image here. We initialize it with a regular grid and then gradually perform splits and merges. You can see in the background that more splits are made Whereas in more informative regions, such as the dog face, you can see that more splits are made. So it results in bigger superpixels in the background and smaller ones in the face. As another example, um, you can see it here how the splits and merges allow us to preserve details. So, for example, look at the girl's eyes or the characters on the top right. So, the adaptiveness of number of superpixels is not only local per image, meaning bigger superpixels in the background and smaller ones in the more informative regions, it's also adaptive when considering different images. So, for example, here, you have two images. The original images are on the bottom. In the middle, you have the mean image. And on the top, you see the superpixel boundaries. So these two images were initialized with the same number of superpixels. However, when we ran our method on it, it converged to two different ones. 
look how the right image is more detailed than the left one. So the right image converges to a bigger number of superpixels. This could be highly useful when dealing with large data sets. To evaluate our method, we compare it with state-of-the-art superpixel methods using some standard matrices. The top one, which is the boundary recall, measures how well do our superpixels adhere to the image boundaries. The second one, which is the under-segmentation error, measures the leakage of superpixels of these boundaries. The last one measures how well do our superpixel explain the variance in the image. In all three matrices, our method performs similar or better than state of the art, even when we restrict it to converge to a similar number. So note that all the other methods, besides TSP, use a fixed and predefined number of superpixels, whereas ours converge to different ones according to the image complexity. So here, we restricted our method to converge to a similar number. To demonstrate how our methods preserve details, we offer here some visual inspection and a more objective quantitative evaluation using phase detection. So here, you can see the results of several methods, including ours on the bottom right. We here too restricted our method to converge to a similar number of superpixels. However, since our method is adaptive, you can see that there are bigger superpixels in the background, in the more homogeneous regions, and small ones in the more informative regions. This results in higher detail preservance. Note the bird's beak or the wooden stick on the left. As another example here, you can see maybe how the other methods are less compact in their superpixel shape, whereas ours is more compact. And same here, in the homogeneous parts, our superpixels are bigger. You can see here how the details are preserved. So for example, look at the woman's face, the eyes, the nostrils, the fingers. Here we wanted to bring a more objective, quantitative evaluation. So what we basically did is we took a state-of-the-art, off-the-shelf deep learning face detector and let it run on the output of several superpixel methods, including ours. And then we counted the number of faces detected after the image was going through some superpixel segmentation. Note that we're not trying to improve on face detection, it's just a downstream application to show that we preserve details. So, in our image on the bottom right, you can see that more faces are detected than in the other methods. Here too, it's also apparent that we detect more faces. Also note the numbers of the players. We ran this experiment on all the data sets. And you can see here that our face detection rates are significantly higher than the other methods. As yet another example, we built on the work of Gade et al, which what they did is they took a deep learning network for semantic segmentation and replaced the pooling layer with the superpixels. The superpixels were not a layer in the network, but they were given it as input. Gade et al used Slick. And we show here that using our method for superpixels improves on semantic segmentation. So using Slick, the result is on the right, and using our method is in the middle. Note the eagle's wings and the bird's legs. So we showed you today a state-of-the-art superpixel method that adapted the image content and details. We believe that using our method as pre-processing step can improve and speed up some other computer vision tasks. See our ICCD paper for more details. Thank you for listening, and the code is available on GitHub. Thank you, Reen Mentar, for your talk. Um, questions? Yes, please.
Uh, did you try uh, separate handling for uh, Homa in uh, intensity? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? To, to separate the handling of uh, Homa color and uh, intensity. No, actually, we use the LAB space as common in recent, recent uh, works on Superpixel, and we haven't tried to use different. Are there more questions? Okay, so I have one. Um, so um, many talks were today on deep learning and you yourself showed a um, very exciting result in cooperating um, your super pixel work within a deep learning framework. What's next? Okay, actually it's a good question and I have an answer for this. Um, first of all, we show an application that used SuperPixel as an input for a network. But we can further improve this. For example, the work that uh, was done using graphical neural network is just a baseline, and they use just a, as a proof of concept they used on MNIST, so we can further improve this. And more than this, we actually can make our uh, method differentiable. Uh, we can remove the connectivity. And instead of using conditional modes to use sampling, and therefore we can improve our differentiability and maybe do end-to-end -end learning. Thank you.